All right, you are joining us on the Movement Podcast and Facebook live stream. What's going on, everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapallo here, hailing to you from the Money Smart Movement team headquarters of PHP Agency, the number one office in all of the United States of America. And I'm excited to have my good friend, my mentor, Tom Ellsworth, a.k.a. BizDoc on Valuetainment and president of PHP Agency. Tom, glad you're here, brother. I am so happy to be here. I love chatting with you and the fact that there's so many people here that can like listen in on this conversation. This this is really inspiring to me because as you know, from my BizDoc case studies that you can see on YouTube to the other things I do like beer and business, interviewing CEOs, I love to teach and I love to dig into just the essence of business and I'm glad we got a, a crowd there watching. So welcome everybody. Absolutely. And by the way, if you haven't done so already, please share this video because as I promised you, all month, uh, the book that we've been reading in, um, in the Entrepreneur Book Club is this book by Ray Dalio, Principles. And b- by the way, this is like this is starting to become, Tom, like my Bible of running our, 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 our business. And just some of the things. I, mean, I got this thing highlighted. I got so many reference points out of, out of this book. And I want to give this book to you guys. The person that shares this with the most timelines in the most groups will get this book from me, from my office to your office, our address to your address, as a gift from the Money Smart Guy, this book by principles, Ray Dahlia, if you're the person that shares this the most timelines and the most groups, and we'll, we'll make sure we, are, we audit that uh, when the show is What's over. What's the deadline? If you get a contest, you got to have a cutoff. Shared yes. by when? Shared by the, en- by the end of this live stream. Shared oh, okay. Yeah, so you got, you got the whole the whole 30, 45 minutes uh, during this conversation uh, until we're done. So, um, we uh, have a winner from last week, and that was John Lange uh, out of Minnesota. So, John Lange, if you're watching right now and you shared this, you shared this video, you're watching it right now. We are sending you a book. We just need to confirm your address. So, Tom, let's get right, let's get right into it. Um, you know, we, we call you Three Comma Tommy because uh, we call him Three Comma Tommy because he built three companies from scratch for over 1.1 billion dollars. And uh, he's already putting money in your pocket. You don't even realize it because uh, he created a unique um, uh, a cell phone pricing package. What would you call it uh, there? Was it the free and clear plan? Well, it was one of the first things I did um, as a young man when I was at Sprint is the best thing that happened to me is uh, Sprint get, hires me. And there, there's not that many people in the uh, wireless division at the time. And we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. And Sprint was a long distance company. And so I come in and i start start asking questions about you know the rate plan we're going to launch with and says hey we have a ne- long distance company next door why shouldn't long distance be in the rate plan and then i said well if our network is all connected by our own fiber optics so that the chicago network's connected to the indianapolis network and it's all our own fiber why would we charge people roaming charges you remember roaming that um, i remember that. charge roaming charges you know wouldn't it be that if you're in a sprint network area you should be on home rates and so we called it any place, anytime, anywhere. So any place Sprint has coverage, your home, anytime, no peak off peak. I'm sure you remember those days. And long distance and call anywhere you want. Long distance is included. And so that rate plan that we launched in San Francisco, I, I'm happy to say that it uh, stripped all the profit out of the wireless industry because it gave the consumers this amazing, amazing plan. And um, people said, but we were making so much money on roaming. We we're making all this. And I said, yeah, but go take a look at this. It's an avalanche of customers who are everybody is able to have a phone now, not just mom or dad who is the breadwinner of the house, everybody. And so um, really, proud, really proud of that moment because uh, not only was it innovative, but, you know, I was able to talk the big company that I was part of at the time into doing it. It also was one of the reasons I said, okay, this is the last time I've ever part of a big company. Right. So, t- Tom, um, yeah, our, our conversation uh, has been revolving because you did a segment of this, a show on this, on value team, around blockchain, around Bitcoin. Um, you know, it was everybody's talking about Bitcoin, 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 up until about 30, 45 days ago, and it dropped. So I had my own skepticism about it. You did a video on it. Can you give us an update what the current state is right now of, uh, of Bitcoin, and then we'll get into uh, blockchain? Yeah, so uh, first of all, the, the cryptocurrencies, I, I think, are shaking out. Um, abs- there's, there's a huge shakeout going on. And the one that appears to have some stability under it is Bitcoin. But, I mean, that thing was up 
closing in on 20,000 and now it's down at uh, what 8,500 or something today, give or take. I haven't yeah. seen the quote today, but that, that's pretty big. Uh, and, and I think there's a bubble around cryptocurrencies. And what I mean by that is like there's two many. How much? That 8,800. Okay. Yep. Right in there. So I, I think there's just too many players inside right now, and there's there's going to be a shakeout um, one way or another. And I think, you know, you can look at it, look at all the different times we've had alternative money. And I don't think anybody thinks about this, but, you know, growing up, Matt, you probably were Matt, and I remember my parents had a Sears card when we went to Sears. They had a Shell card and a Chevron card when they went to the gas station. Um, remember all that? And, I and then And then Visa and MasterCard partners with the bank. So every time you had an ATM card, it just said Visa or MasterCard in the corner. And I remember early ATMs, you looked at the back of your ATM card and it'd be all those little symbols, plus system and everything. And you had to make sure that that symbol was at the ATM because that meant you could use it. But what happened? There's a big shakeout. So what is our money now? Our bank will have a relationship with Visa or MasterCard. And Discover Card is hanging on for dear life and American Express is still around. But that's it. That's it for consumer credit. So people should think about cryptocurrency the same way. You have all these players, uh, just like you had gas cards, department store cards, diners club, the Discover card, all those things that were there, but they all kind of shook out over time. And I think that's in, in a digital world, that's just happening faster. And I think that Bitcoin plus two is probably going to be, you know, what the survival state is. And so you've got Bitcoin and then I call the second tier Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum and Litecoin. And so I think out of those four, you're probably going to have two or three survive. Ripple is down there kind of below eyesight, trying desperately to get on um, uh, Coinbase's stock market, trying to get covered there. So maybe Ripple jumps up. But I think we're going to see a shakeout. And then in terms of pricing, everybody's going to settle down and we're going to find out what the what the real um, the water is. Yeah. You know, what, what the rural high tide, low tide is. Um, I was listening the other day, and it was one of the banking presidents said, I know there's a bubble, and people can Google this so they could, like, put it on their Facebook or tweet it. Um, I know there's a bubble when the guy shining my shoes is giving me investment advice on cryptocurrency. Um, or, or my hairdresser is saying, yeah, I'm going to take half my 401k and just put it in Bitcoin. He says, you know, there's a bubble when there's that kind of enthusiasm. And with all due respect to hairdressers and shoe shine guys, the people that, that are, are willing to make that kind of an impulsive decision based on this frothiness and this, uh, what's going on in the market. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that crosses the line of prudence and it becomes kind of dangerous for the, for the average person you know, with whatever retirement they do have, that they're willing to put it at such risk simply because everybody's doing it. It reminds me of the, the, real, estate, the real estate crisis. Everybody's getting a mortgage. Everybody's jumping on the real estate bandwagon. And I remember even this, I mean, I remember even in, in the, when I first started my career in 99, 2000, everybody's getting on every dot com here, dot com this, dot com that. I've seen this trend happening two times in my 19 year career. Um, why do you think Facebook and Google shut down all ads pertaining to cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, anything that's getting involved in that? What do you think they did that for? Well, I think, um, I think what you also have to add in there is Twitter. Twitter did the same thing. Oh, Twitter, okay. Um, yeah, they, well, they all did. And I think what they're all saying is like, hang on a second. You know, um, there's got to be some prudence that is put here. And I think that, you know, Facebook and Google and Twitter all are being very, very careful with commerce and advertising in general, with uh, Twitter kind of being behind. Um, and of course, Facebook's having its own bad week. Um, yeah. All by itself. For, for other reasons. <laughs> It's like, you know, you know, remember the Where's Waldo game? Yeah, Wall Street's cur currently playing the Where's Zuckerberg game. He's completely in hiding, won't say anything. It's a whole other story. But I, I think what you have is they all looked at the ads and they said, hang on a second. There's a lot of things in here we don't know. When somebody, when General Motors puts an ad for a car on Facebook or Google or wherever or a sponsored tweet, 
you know, there's some credibility behind the products. I know what's up. I think there's just so much shakeout that needs to happen and there's so much uncertainty and there's so much risk to the common man. I think they've all prudently said, time out. We're not going to advertise these for now. We're going to let this thing shake out. Especially they're making that announcement now after so many people, and you can read the blogs and you can see the blogs out there. A lot of people put part of their retirement in at 17,000, you know, at December on Bitcoin. Where is it right now? Uh, half that, a little more than half that. So if they put, so if they put part of their, their livelihood or savings or whatever, in, they, half of, they've lost half of it. Um, unless it comes back up. But right now they're in a, a half lost position. And yeah. I think that Google and Facebook and everybody said, hang on, this needs to shake out and this gets some credibility behind it. And until then, we're not advertising exchanges. We're not advertising uh, ICOs. We're not advertising you know, new cryptocurrencies, you know, regardless of whether it's the ones that are established, well known, Ethereum, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin and, and Ripple. You know, uh, we're, we're just stepping back from this. We're going to let this sort out before we advertise it. Got it. Um now, in a recent in a recent uh, uh, magazine in our, in, our, in our industry, Insurance News Net, we're talking about uh, blockchain. Now, lots of times people confuse Bitcoin and blockchain being the same thing. Can you break down a little bit? What's the big difference between Bitcoin and blockchain? Because blockchain is really affecting our industry, which is the insurance industry. Yeah, I think. First of all, I think I think cryptocurrency and blockchain are both exciting for different reasons. You know, I think um, uh, I think. The cryptocurrencies are exciting from the standpoint of you're going down a hill covered with ice with bald tires and no brakes. That's the wrong. <laughs> kind. That's the wrong kind of exciting. You know, um, the other exciting in blockchain, I think it's it's a real breakthrough. I mean, when we think about think about a company that many of us know because of the LifeLock. Where did LifeLock come from? LifeLock came out of freaking nowhere. Um, oh eight. 07, um, you know, when they were started, something like that. Yeah. And when they started, it was because identity step was everywhere. Well, okay. what, did, what did we have there? Well, online commerce made it easy, easier, provided another avenue for criminals to use stolen information, get goods and services, do all sorts of things. And so, you know, LifeLock comes out there offering one of the ways to protect yourself from identity theft. Well, along comes blockchain, and I, I see these two things as related. What well, blockchain is, where you get think about it is this. Blockchain is just another database. Don't think of it in terms of cryptocurrency. Just say blockchain is a database that has security and integrity. Security, because of the way it's architected, it's very hard to alter the contents that are in there. And it's a ledger of transactions or your bank balance. So you've got, you know, integrity of the contents and you have the security of the contents. The integrity comes from all these nodes or elements in there are cross-checking each other. So there's no master computer to go hack, make a change, and to take $10,000 out of Matt's account and then get out the back door. Yeah. Because the nodes that are in this amazing database are chained together and they're all cross-checking you know, the balances. So you've got security. It's, you know, very, very, very difficult to hack. But once you hack in, it has integrity because all of the different points in there are pointing out that Matt has $10,000 in the account. And if something changes on that, there's immediate recognition. So what blockchain allows you to do, think of it as a great big database for the future, especially in finance. Just yeah. put that headline yeah. in your head, a great big new type of database for finance, your bank will be using it, your credit card will be using it, and it has integrity and security because of all the things that make up the reason they call it the blockchain. All of these blocks and nodes chained together with integrity and security. So when you see blockchain, don't think about the cryptocurrencies, just think about a new database. Oh, that's a new database that's got integrity and security because of the way it's distributed and cross-checked everywhere. So I think the average person should think about it that way. And if your bank is using blockchain technology, and I think most of the major banks are all talking about it, either implementing it or they're, they've implemented it um, to protect all the, um, what we would say, Matt, the custodial accounts. Yep. And I'm thinking also about all my veterans out there that uh, follow my page. 
and watch us on, uh, on YouTube. All, imagine if all the veterans can go to any other VA hospital in the VA network. And you're part of, your, your dad is part of the blockchain network. Because every time we got to go to a different VA for our physicals and updates, you got to always start from scratch, fill out the paperwork all over again from the bottom. And imagine having a blockchain database where East Coast, West Coast, you know, North, South, uh, it's inside the VA network to streamline, cut costs, and make our students a lot better. It is secure, so, no, it's secure yeah. so nobody knows about your health condition except the doctors that are authorized to do so. So you've got personal privacy that goes along with this. Yeah. So it's um, you're absolutely right. I think the applications for blockchain are going to be far and wide, and it starts with our banking industry that, you know, with identity theft and everything we've seen over the last 20 years, and people like LifeLock trying to protect that, blockchain just steps it up a level and says, well, I don't need LifeLock to talk about my Citibank account anymore because my, my, they may try to steal my identity, but all my, um, all my assets are safe. Ah, I like that. That's, that's, that's good for our end. Um, guys, if you tune in right now, you're watching the movement live stream on the Money Smart Guy page. And if uh, you are so kind to of share this video, um, this book, From My Desk to Your Office, Principles by Ray Dalio. And we're, if you're tuning in right now, the gentleman I'm having a conversation with is Tom Bizdoc Ellsworth. He's the host of the Bizdoc, breaking down uh, uh, case studies and also business and beer on value payment. And uh, well, let's, let's talk about that. You know, you, you interview a lot of successful entrepreneurs. You've been on, uh, on three different uh, companies scratched to sale totaling over $1.1 billion. What makes, a, what makes what's some habits that successful entrepreneurs can adopt to, to follow that, that chain of success? Because there's one thing to get there, right? And so let's talk about that first. first. How to get from scratch to, to becoming that type of company? Some habits. Right. You know, I, I think there's a couple things. Whenever I would, you know, uh, I was running an investment incubator for a while, and one of the things I would look in there, I always wanted to see belief in what they were doing. And that was mm. the first thing I wanted to see. I wanted to see true belief in what you were doing. The second thing I wanted to see was true skin in the game. You know, don't just come in with a, a business plan and, you know, you're going to pay yourself a salary out of the investment money. No, I want to see that you bootstrapped it, meaning those first ten, twenty thousand dollars yourself, or you worked weekends, you worked nights, and you truly bootstrapped it, got it from point zero to point one. Um, I want to see that, and, and then I also want to see within that belief a lack of hubris. And hubris is conceit and arrogance and stupidity all wrapped up into one big, very bad brownie. So it's like <laughs> hubris, Brian. It's it's a one of those um, Chipotle burritos that would make you sick, and it's full of hubris, it's full of conceit, it's full of arrogance. Because along the way, you have to be flexible enough to stay on your your discipline about what you're building, and you don't want to be distracted. You want to stay on focus. Well. You know, and some people, when they smell the slightest bit of failure resistance, oh, we're going to go this way. No, no, we're going to go this way. Well, that's that's unfocused. I wanted to see focus, discipline, and uh, and integrity. I wanted to see that from a founder that had some skin in the game, that was not easily distracted, but didn't have hubris. So if they get to a certain milestone and it's really not there, they would back up and say, okay, now what's happening? What's not happening? And what should we do about it? Uh, and those are the things at the startup phase I would look for in entrepreneurs. And if there was hubris or arrogance or any of those things, I would be like, you know, all of these feelings are okay right now where you've got this grand idea, you're trying to get off the ground, but all these, these things are going to be terrible weaknesses if the company has to pivot a little bit or adjust the product a little bit to decide what they're going to do. Let me give you a great example. You want a good example? I love a great example. Twitter. What did Twitter start out to be? Do you remember? It, it was, uh, when it first started, it was uh, like a new suit. Uh, just uh, Before so, that, Jack Dorsey looks in San Francisco and would see all these bicycle messengers running around San Francisco. San Francisco is, you know, five miles by four miles, roughly. And the financial district is like half of that. 
And originally there were these bike messengers and Jack Dorsey envisioned a little system where a bike messenger could see where there was an opportunity and he could go there. So oh. think about Uber for bike messengers way back when, but all bike messengers could be like, hey, I'm closest, I've got it. And then all the businesses that would use these bike messengers that had these big weatherproof satchels, and they would carry documents around. And there still was documents. You say, why don't they email them? Well, there is legal documents and stuff needed to be signed, had to be signed. And they say, hey, go to this place and have these people sign these docs, bring them back to the real estate office, and we'll get the escrow closed because you had to have a live signature. So he starts out doing that. And that was what Twitter's original vision was. And all of a sudden, we all know what happened. It was like a bomb going off, and it was something different. Well, what if he had resisted, you know, building all the infrastructure to help it go big? What if he said, no, no, damn it, I'm making a bike messenger system, and everybody, you know, is, is trying to do all these wacky things with it? Well, so you got to be flexible. And hubris is something I look for. Hubris, arrogance, conceit. I don't want to see those traits because when there's an opportunity to shift because things aren't working or things are working like Twitter and they're like, wow, the hell with bike messengering. We're going to let the whole world communicate in a new and different way. Um, and it's a phenomenal product. But it's, it's interesting. WD-40 is another one of my favorite examples. They were trying to make a degreaser so that, you know, that could be used in all kinds of mechanical applications, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, remove grease from, from parts so they could be worked on. And on the 40th formula, they came up with the opposite of degreaser, an amazing lubricant. And wow. they call it, call it WD-40 because it was the 40th formula, formula they had put together trying to make a degreaser. Well, if they just sat there saying, well, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Wait a minute. This is the opposite of degreaser. This is like a, a lubricant. But look at all these crazy things you could do with it. And that's where WD-40 comes from. So those are the traits I like to see is stay focused, have discipline, have integrity, and don't be distractible easily. But also don't have hubris where you just refuse to believe what's happening with arrogance and conceit and, you know, you and the money just go off the cliff. Uh, so that's kind of what I look for. And I love to share with people the story of Twitter and WD-40 to say, I want your vision to work and I want you to focus on it and stay with it and make sure that you work on it and don't be distracted. But when you've run enough cycles, we've done enough tests and the market is showing us something else at that moment, you also have to be flexible enough to change the heading on the compass. Nice. Makes, makes, makes me think about the, we could have been WD39 instead of WD40 or, or preparation B versus preparation H. <laughs> Or, or, or a friend of mine that worked at, Fi at, uh, at Pfizer and they accidentally found Viagra. Right? It's supposed to be a, uh, it was supposed to be heart medication, but it uh, triggered a different muscle. <laughs> I don't know. It'll get your heart going. <laughs> so it did, just not the way they thought it. Did. So awesome. <laughs> Avoid hubris. That's 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 my word. So um, let, let's speak it because. Hubris is a word that I see is related to this. What about individuals, like, like entrepreneurs, they make the first hundred grand in business, they make the two hundred thousand dollars in business, they make the first million dollars in business. I mean, it's, it's just like billion dollar companies that hubris affects. It's, it's a, it's a, it's an evergreen world to the whole entrepreneurial landscape, isn't it? Yeah, you know, when you get hubris in large groups, um, there's a phrase about. Uh, large companies and the bigger it gets it could be a large organization or it could be a large company it could be five people at the top of a large organization or it could be five people running a small organization what i like to say is when hubris is involved nobody is as dumb as all of us and um and that's and that's kind of where you know i see it it's in that you know in large companies and stuff what what you'll have is um Committees will get together and you, you make decisions out of fear or out of intimidation or any one of a number of, of you know, political reasons. Um, and, you know, you, you screw it up as a group. So you're, you're right. There's, there's hubris at the company level, but there's usually an individual, a CEO, a head of product or somebody at the company level whose personal hubris is influencing a whole crowd because they don't want to stand up to them or they, or maybe it's a person that's impossible to have a debate with. 
But you're right. Hubris can, can come out of large companies or it can come out of one guy who got 25 grand from friends and family and just wasn't reading what the market was telling him and burns all that, all the friends and family money, just throws it in a shredder. I, I want to shift this conversation to uh, an industry that isn't looked at a lot, which is, which I, which I like because we're disrupting it. But um, a lot, a lot of people say, hey, Matt, you know, you know, you're the money smart guy. You know, I get people pitching me all the time, cryptocurrency, real estate, tech, solar, all this stuff. But I've, I've stuck for 19 years to the insurance industry. Uh, Tom, why did you come out of the retirement after selling these two companies? You were on the board of PHP agency. But what got you out of retirement? So, you know what? Patrick McDavid's got something going on here with PHP agency. The insurance industry has got something going on. What, what inspired you to, to, to do that? Well, there's two things, really. <clears throat> the first thing is that everything I was a part of, I was a part of helping building something big and national. And there's a lot of fun building something big and national. I mean, a serious amount of fun. Um, because you love to see the disruption in the market and building, building it out. So I love that because that's just part of the growth curve that I just love to ride. That's my favorite kind of wave to surf. So then it is, okay, well, you know, what industry are you surfing that wave in? What are you doing? And what I saw in, in life insurance specifically was that this is a noble product, an absolutely noble product. This is a product people need. We're not selling them an SUV before the minivan's worn out and that they really don't need to be buying a new car. You know, they should, you know, the old car has got some years left on it, great condition. But people just want a new car. You know, we're not doing that. We're not facilitating that. We're also not trying to get them to go from paying 40 bucks a month for cable to pay 80 bucks because we're going to sell them the HBO Stars Super Pack. And, yeah. you know, how much TV can you be watching in a day and how much TV should you be watching, you know? So we're not doing that. This is a noble product. You're going to need it. It's, I call it first base in, in, the, in the ball game of finance. First base. Yeah. Even before you, even if you can't afford to save anything, save your family from disaster. Mm. And that's a, that's a noble product. You know, yeah. even if you, if you tell me you can't afford to save anything, but you still have to pay 40 bucks a month on top of your basic cable for Game of Thrones, I, I, then I'll say, question is, you know, well, then what's more important, Game of Thrones or, you know, looking at all these kings and queens and their family or the game of your family? You know, you could get a term policy for 40 bucks a month for something. So let's start at first base in, in this ball game of protecting your family. Even if you can't save money every month to build savings account, you can certainly save them from disaster. But to me, that's a noble product and a noble effort. Then I'll take you to PHP. And PHP is giving people a shot to be the life insurance agent in their community that does exactly what I just said. So now you can have the opportunity to be that. So we're giving people an opportunity to do something maybe they didn't think they'd have an opportunity to do, be a life insurance agent. Maybe they have a GED, maybe they spent high school and then three years in the military and they feel like, well, I don't have any formal education. Time out, if you've got just some basic math skills and just a little bit of communication personality, you know, we've got this platform here called PHP. Come ride with us. We'll make you a very productive life insurance agent. And you'll be selling a noble product to get a lot of your friends and family to, to first base and beyond. You want to go beyond first base? Be an agent too. Just want to get first base and protect your family, save your family from disaster, even if you don't have a lot of money to save yourself. You know what? We can do that. And... This is a national play. I love what we're doing on a national basis that, that the face of America is changing. It's all changing. I go back to my you know, great grandparents were Canadians. So we came from the north. But it seems like, you know, a tremendous amount of the new America has come from the south, from Latin America, not just Mexico, all corners of Latin America <clears throat> because of the promise offered by the U.S. So I see a national expansion, which is the wave I love to ride. Um, helping all of this this wonderful multicultural uh, part of the new American middle class sell a noble product and along the way members of that community can be a very successful life insurance salesperson 
when maybe they didn't think they were going to be able to do very much in life because they're, they're living in some self-doubt. Well, I just have a high school diploma. I only have a GED or I, I just had a little bit of military. I'm like, that doesn't matter. You know, come ride this wave on a national expansion of what we're doing. And so I know that's a long answer, Matt, but that's really the story that got me out. There was all those elements to it. PHP, the platform, life insurance, the product, national expansion. It, it all came together. The changing face of America, um, it, it all came together. And I said, you know, what? I don't want to do this. Whether I do it for one year or 10 years, I mean, who knows what God, you know, God gives me or, you know, how this shakes out. But, you know, I'm here now and every day I wake up, it's like, okay, what else can we do here? This is, this is fun. Tom, I want to point out this report. You know, I, I shared this last week in the live stream. It's a report written in September 2017 by the Institute for Policy Studies. And um, there's four authors to this report. It's, it's called The Road to Wealth, How the Racial Wealth Divide is, uh, is, disrupt, is Destroying the American middle, Multicultural Middle Class. And so, so basically it's saying that there's, there's a separation that's happening right now. And it's just not the last one, five, ten years. It's, they're going back to 20, 30 years of this. So with, with regard to insurance, because lots of times people don't even think that life insurance, people think it's a, it's a luxury item. And so when you just mentioned it's a priority item. But people think it's a luxury item. Do you think that wealth divide has happened because of lack of education, lack of insurance agents in the marketplace today is, is what you've observed? Well, I, I think I think there's two things there. I, I think we've gone from a um, – we had entrepreneurial instincts in America going back right after World War II. I mean, we came back to get to work on the country. And the president at that time, Franklin Roosevelt, had these WPA um, projects. And so we were building America. We were building bridges and stuff. And, that, and there was a mentality of we're building and establishing it. And long before the malls and the, what they call the big box retailers, you had in your town people who were just entrepreneurial because they needed to be. Because if there's going to be a butcher in town, somebody had to be the butcher. Somebody mm -hmm. had to be the cobbler. Somebody was the shoe store. Somebody was the drug store. Somebody was the doctor. And all of that was kind of this American work ethic. And, it, and it, it cut across class. It cut across race. It cut across culture. It was the American work ethic that came after World War II. And I, I think that that work ethic became the job ethic where you just have a job. And then in the 60s, it was like, well, the Vietnam War and everything, I think was a crossing point where, you know, working for the man and the man was, you know, the business owner or something. And there was some negativity that came there. And I think that's where it started to slip in the late 60s, summer of love, 1969. People can Google that and see what all that means. And I think what happened is America lost this attitude that we had at the end of World War II where everybody came home to do something and be something. And all of a sudden, it was the, it was the, from the, you know, work and be something, it was to do, go get something, get a job. And when you go into the full job mentality, you know, I think you can end up on a dead end street that it says, well, you know, like I, like I just mentioned, I only have a high school diploma or I only have this or this is all only who I am. So I have to go get a job. I have to go get paid. And so it's get. What do I have to get? I have to get. I have to get. I think we've lost that. And I think the life insurance industry has long had its foundation on the independent agent that was building a business for themselves. That is something that hasn't changed. It's actually shrank. And so the opportunity for people to be agents now is greater than it was five years ago, greater still than 10 years ago, and greater still than 15 years ago. It actually was an industry that lost interest in people. I mean, I don't remember anybody, you know, that were my friends that says, I'm going to be a life insurance agent, you know. But now we, we see at this wonderful, noble product in an industry that needs entrepreneurial-minded people to be the independent agent. So I, I think there's an opportunity to life insurance to, to come back and to reinstitute a lot of these foundational things that were there at the end of World War II, which, you know, have deteriorated over time. I mean, you know, go rather than worry about someone giving so that you can get, 
go B. I rather go B. Now, Tom, PHU agency is an insurance marketing organization. Has had twelve. Is am I right now? Twelve, going at thirteen positive quarters, beating the last quarter. Yeah, well, it's on quite. It's quite a run. It's like nearly three years. You know, on a, on a run where quarter over quarter, you know, you know, yeah. we beat, and it's just um, it's an amazing thing. So, so can, can, can you, I, I love just to have you paint me a picture of what it was like to explain this to to Gabriel Brenner to to, to Oscar De La Hoya, who invested ten million dollars. I, I mean, I love. Can you give me a little insight of what that was like? I know. I think Jose Gaetan is watching us right now. We love these stories from you. It's like it's like Uncle Tommy. You know, tell us a story about what it's like to be in that boardroom to be with Oscar De La Hoya and Greg, uh, Greg Share, and to have a $10 million investment conversation to Peach Well, the that? first thing, well, the first thing is, you know, that conversation can't happen if it wasn't for you and Gaetan and George Palio and Len Cooper and Jason Graziani and Diana Joe. Hector Del Toro. I'm trying to remember all of the SVPs in the top of the legs here. I don't want to miss. Yeah. And then the Vargas is down in Houston. All of them. If it wasn't for that group, we've got nothing to sell. We, hey, we built a great big platform to do this for life insurance. Prove it. Ah, look at all these people, what they're doing. Look at their organization. Look how their lives have been changed. Um, without that list of people, there's nothing to sell. It's just, you know, a guy, Patrick Bet David, with a tremendous vision, but, and built a platform you know, to build life insurance agents. But if the proof, if the, there they are, look at all those folks. But if the proof isn't there, then, you know, it's not there. So the first element was Gabriel Brenner, uh, uh, Greg Scher of Ambina Partners, the Adelaide Group, they all looked at this through two vectors. The first vector they looked at is, wow, look at the financial performance and look at what's happening here. And the second they looked at, they say, this is both timely necessary for America uh, because of what you're doing, you know, in the Hispanic market, because such a huge part of who we are and who the American middle class is, is, is this in incredible, wonderful, you know, diversity of Hispanic cultures. And Gabriel Brenner being the only Mexican board owner of a uh, professional sports team, and people think, oh, he owns the Houston Dynamo. Well, actually, he owns a company called Forever Orange, which owns the Dynamo, the women's soccer team called the Crush, and BBDA Stadium downtown. So Forever Orange is a giant you know, company that, that owns all of that. Um, so when soccer is not being played, he's got concerts at the stadium. But nonetheless, he's the only Mexican-born um, owner of a U.S. professional sports franchise, and he's got two uh, the women's women's soccer club and the men's soccer club. And he looked at it and he said, I want to invest in things that are, you know, good, solid investments. But also I love investing in things where my heart is, which is enabling the Hispanic, uh, you know, citizenry and market to achieve something and to be enabled something or bring really great products to them. So that's where it all came together for, for him um, and, and Oscar as well. Oscar is a co-investor and co-owner in the Houston Dynamo. And so, you know, being in the room with them, you know, uh, you know, you know, you sell the story of Patrick and the vision he had, but then you, you don't really need to sell the story. You just show the story of all these wonderful people and this tremendous diversity that's out there that is succeeding for PHP. And so you put those two there and no hubris, don't get cocky, don't get arrogant. You just say, well, that's what we're doing. Pretty good story. You're interested. And then, you know, you get people saying, yeah, I'm very interested. I want to be a part of that. I want to support that. What are you doing? Well, we're, you know, we're raising some expansion capital so we can go even faster. And um, we had grown to a point that, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, we want, to, we want to go fast. The model works and we want to go fast. So what it's like to be in the room, i give you some words. It's ratifying. You know, it's satisfying. It's confirming, you know, and... You know, what you knew walking in that you were you, you had you know, a great deal of faith and confidence in what all of you have done in the field, Matt, and Jose and everybody else that's watching. But it's also, you know, then just the ratification because they, they get the joke. They see the story and they're like, you know what? I want to be a part of this. All for the right reasons. You know, it wasn't just about the financials. 
the financials have to be there, but it wasn't just about that. It was about what PHP is doing in America today, in the life insurance market today, and how it's performing financially today. And people said, really, that's what's going on today? Guess what? I'm going to invest because I can't wait to see what it's going to be tomorrow. That's awesome. I'm just glad that, um, you know, when we do our job in the field, uh, to, to present them some for you guys, I'm just so happy to have executives like you at, at the home office team to execute on something like this that, you know, this, you know, this is for some guys is way above the pay grade, even the confidence level. And I'm just glad we have guys like you swinging the back for us so with the experience that you have and the credibility that you have in the marketplace. And, and, and it's an option now for 19 years, I've never had this type of leverage of relationship, this leverage in, of excitement. And uh, I've never had this much fun in the insurance industry because in my first 12 years as a producer, and I was burning out as a salesperson. And, uh, and, this, and by the way, maybe that's uh, for some of you watching this in a replay or watching this live right now, if you're, if you're in sales, you know, God bless you that you're still grinding out every day. And, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, Somebody stole my hat. I have my hat. Make insurance cool again. And, you know, yeah. people in the industry, do you have it? Yes. You know, we're moving, we're moving our office. Gotta get some rap. Ah. No time. No time. <laughs> We're all for our hats. <laughs> Wait, I, I, I got this red hat. It says make insurance cool again. And the funny thing is, you know, you have people say, again? <laughs> was it ever cool? Right? Exactly, exactly right. Was it, was it, wait, wait, was it ever cool? Anyway. Sorry. Well, guys, uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Tom, thank you so much for your time. I just appreciate these conversations. Um, I look forward to seeing you soon um, uh, in Dallas. I think a Train the Trainer, we're going to be at uh, in May. Uh, there in Dallas, uh, our, our, our field force will be down there. A qualified field force will be down there for Train the Trainer. Um, uh, to, any, by the way, any insight, because I know for the guys that got sock. Is it going to be like last year where we were able to get the stock, we get the FedEx tax, get a stock option, a stock option to, uh, deal, we signed in front of everybody? Just by any chance, would that, would that opportunity present itself in May? I don't know. For the people that qualified for stock, I appreciate it last year. Well, Patrick wouldn't want me to give you any leaks, give you the answer on that. <laughs> oops, oops, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's going to be so awesome. That's going to be so awesome. So, uh, Tom, I just appreciate, you know, you, you tell me the way it is. I, I appreciate your coaching and guiding me and helping me mature as a man, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a leader. I appreciate the, the messages you sent out to me. It was so helpful because sometimes I don't see my own blind spots. And uh, I'm just glad you're there to, to, give me, to, to give me that push and that urge to, to, to step on and be the next best version of myself. So I appreciate you being on this live stream, Tom. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, I want you to have a, have a great day. Here's to you. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, listen, you've been watching to the Movement Podcast. That's for you. We're, not, we're, not, we're not drinking at lunch. That's for you. That's a, that's a toast to you, Matt, and all that you're doing because you're out there trying to educate. You're building an office, and you talk about your blind spots, everything. And, um, you know, I've met your wife, and I'll say, you know, you're anything but blind. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, she's, she's, she's definitely she's definitely my better half. That's for sure. That's for I, sure. I, call, I call her my sister because she's she's as tight on uh, processes and operations as I am, and um, you know it's uh, it's just it's clear to see how you both come together. And this is the opportunity. I think this is the hidden gem of the opportunity of PHP, where you can work together, husband and wife, be a real power couple, build your agency, and do all that. And I think all that just comes together, and it's just. Um, I think people need to see that part of it too. That story is also one I think gets kind of hidden, but um, this is a great opportunity for husbands and wives to drive. Yeah, they're work, working together to see examples like Jose Marlene Baton and the Dolphin Sessing Vargas, you know, and on and on and on. All the stories that we have with inside the company, married couples working together where the myth was, you know, stay away from each other. We want to go apart from each other. We want to, we want to build our lives together. And, the business and entrepreneurship is allowing us to do that and grow and grow together. So, yeah, huge shit in gym for PHP. So, appreciate it, Tom. You Thank guys you so much, sir. Appreciate it. it. You got it. 
And for those of you guys right. watching, this, this wraps up our show this week, every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, the movement hosted by your truly Money Smart Guy is here to share your value to help transform the way you think, feel, manage, and reach towards financial independence. Thanks for tuning in. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our page on Facebook. If you're watching this replay on YouTube, please subscribe and be part of the notification squad for the next video that goes up on YouTube. And if you have done so already yet, you have about 30 seconds to share this video before we select the person that shares this the most on timelines, in groups, on Facebook, on Twitter, and you'll get from me to you the book of the month for the Entrepreneur Book Club, which is Principles by Ray Dalio. I am tearing this puppy up. Um, I love this book. It's great to speak to me and share with me. Life works, his story. And, uh, and uh, my guest today is Tom Bizdoc Elzer. Make sure you watch Value Tainment for his episodes of case studies and business and beer. Uh, Tom, when do you, when do you, uh, when do you release those, um, uh, uh, your, uh, your shows? I'm, I'm very first, first thing in the morning, every Friday. So every Friday. It'd, be, it'd be eight, nine or 10 AM, depending on what time zone you're in in the United States, but it's Friday morning, every Friday, every other week, we have a beer and business with the CEO I interview. And every other week, it's a case study where I break something down. So it's every other, every other, Week is a different it's business of being a case study, but right. every Friday morning. Roger case that. study every other week, beer in business every other week. But every Friday, something for you entrepreneurs to chew on. From the BizDoc. Cool. Well, on behalf of BizDoc, Tom Ellsworth, I'm yours truly, my smart guy. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for being part of our conversation. Until we meet again. Continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be mighty smart today. Have a great week. See you, Tom.